and friends. My purpose today was to go into the question of how the money that has gone out of the country can be brought back. The, two, the book that I have released today deals with one circumstance in which a lot of money has gone abroad. But money has been consistently growing. And today they say half a trillion dollars, which is about more than 50% of our GDP, much more than 50%, maybe about 65% of our GDP is today in foreign countries, in foreign banks. 2G has become symbolic of what is wrong in the country. Most people don't even know what 2G is. During the election campaign, I was going by car from Namakal to Coimbatore. And on the way, I was stopped by an old lady who asked me whether I was Subramanian Swami. I said, yes. She says, 2G Uradam Go. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to 2G Nam Puriyaman. <laughs> so it is sort of filtered that way. I don't blame her because once Manmohan Singh was asked, what is 2G? He said, Sonia G and Rahul G. <laughs> Today when I speak to you about how to bring back black money from abroad. I will organize my talk in four parts. First, what is black money and why is it created? Two, how does it travel abroad? Three, how does that this money actually harm the country? Is it just your money going out or is there a multi-dimensional harm to the country? And four, how to bring it back. These are the four aspects I will deal with. And in the course, I'll try to illustrate through this 2G example. Now what is black money? It is actually cash payment to a recipient in a transaction which is not recorded in any account, any legitimate account or at least if I may say audited account. It may be accounted for in the diary of some people like Raja had a diary who all got it. And that diary has still not come out. It is lying in CBI locker. It will come out. There was a Hawala diary once upon a time which created a lot of uh, problems. Now when you say this, that it is a cash payment to a recipient, there are two parties in it, the giver and the taker. The giver knows he is giving unaccounted money, unaudited money, and the taker also knows that he is taking money which is not to be accounted. Now if you give money, supposing I have black money and I go to a fruit shop and buy some fruit and hand that money to the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper is not a participant. He does not know that this is black money. And he normally conducts his transaction in cash. So you have to make this distinction. Because this Congress party recently said Baba Ramdev receives money in black money. Because he accepts cash. Well, all sadhus accept Dakshina. 
And if all Swami is accepted, then you and I can also accept. <laughs> but that money, how would Baba Ramdev know that it is black money? He audits it, it goes to the income tax, it may be kept in a trust. So I think we have to be very clear that there must be two parties, the giver and the taker, and both should know that this is black money. Now, sometimes both parties know this, so the black money comes and then it becomes white money. So black money is not necessarily a stock of money. But it's also money which keeps flowing into the economy, becoming black, then white, then white, then black. For instance, an industrialist gives a political party. Donation is cash. The reason he gives donation in cash is he says, if I give a check, and you are the opposition party, then the ruling party will trace it and then will harass me with income tax and other things. Why did you give to the opposition party? So I don't want any trace left. So here I'm giving you in cash. The income tax law says that if you get a donation of less than 20,000 rupees in cash, I think it is now being raised to 40,000 then you don't have to disclose the source from whom you got the money. So if somebody wants to give one lakh rupees, he gives twenty thousand five times. So that there is no record of it. The political party puts it in the bank and under section 313 of the income tax, the political party does not have to pay any income tax. It just has to say that this money is a donation and the amount was less than 20,000. And then it can issue checks against it to the printer who brings the poster, to the man who brings the pandal. It can give checks on it. So there you see black going into an account and then becoming white through, through a check system. So therefore it's, this is not an easy subject black money, because this black money goes in and out into white and black, white and black. But when it goes abroad and it is deposited in a Swiss bank account, say, Switzerland is not now anymore the only country which has secret accounts. There are 77 countries which have secret Banking secrecy for, uh, for deposits made without any proof that this money has been legitimately obtained. So, supposing I take the example of Switzerland, money is deposited in your account, that is a stock, it remains as a stock, and it does not come out of it. It is being kept there. In fact, uh, Indians are so insecure that they keep money in Switzerland banks and then they don't even keep a beneficiary uh, name. And when they die, it becomes part of Switzerland. And one banking chairman of Switzerland told me that if the Indians are not there, our economy will go bankrupt. <laughs> so, so many people, money becomes part of this budget. So this, this is one, and therefore, this black money is created by a number of ways. In a transaction, supposing I am buying a house, to get uh, the tax lower, I undervalue the property and pay the remaining in cash. I am exporting for importing. I understate the price of export, overstate the price of imports. This is called over invoicing and under invoicing. That is the way black money is created. 
I don't want to pay taxes, so I falsely declare my income is lower than it is, and the remaining part I keep in cash. So black money is created largely because in circle in India it began because we had laws which were encouraging this kind of thing. After independence, Mahatma Gandhi and Sardar Patel have said, let us not adopt the Soviet economic model because it doesn't suit us. But Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated. Sardar Patel died of natural causes. And Nehru became all in all and he was fascinated by the Soviet model. And the Soviet model, everything was controlled. Of course, the Soviet model was totally unsuited for us because it was based on the assumption that money will be extracted from agriculture and invested in heavy industrialization. <laughs> but the British had already extracted all the money from our agriculture. There was nothing left to extract. And that is why soon, very soon, we had a, a crisis in agriculture which fortunately two Tamilians, one C. Subramanyam and one Swaminathan, they brought economic revolution to the revolution. And we were saved. But the Soviet model lowered our growth rate because there was no incentive to work. There was wealth tax, there was income tax, wealth tax, if you added the two, after a certain level of income you were paying more than 100% of your income as tax. Who will pay? Rich people, an income tax officer, underpaid. So naturally the rich people will give money to the income tax and get their accounts clear. In fact, till 1996, Dhirubhai Ambani did not pay income tax at all. And G. D. Pirla's income was only 18,000 rupees per year. A new breed of chartered accountants came, no offense to the chartered accountants of the audience, who created this accounting system, this double accounting system, which ultimately created black money. So it model now is created everywhere. I remember Namudri Paz once giving me a lecture saying that capitalism is full of crises. I said, what about Soviet Union? He said, there is no unemployment in the Soviet Union, there is no inflation in the Soviet Union, there is no poverty in the Soviet Union. In 1991, I told Namudipa, now there is no Soviet Union also. <laughs> it has broken up into 16 countries. Uzbekistan, Lithuania, everybody has become independent. And all you have is left is with Russia. But yet people talked about the Hindu rate of growth. It has nothing to do with the Hindu rate of growth. It was the Soviet rate of growth. And in 1991, I had become minister and we had this huge crisis of foreign exchange. So at that time, I prepared the blueprints. Unfortunately, the Nusheka government fell and Nasima Rao came. And Nasima Rao asked me to join his government on the condition that I would become member of Congress. I went and asked Parmacharya, shall I join Congress? He says, where do you went on? The picture of Bhove Brother. So I did not join. So I did not become a minister, but I became a cabinet rank chairman of the GATT Commission, and therefore I attended the cabinet meeting. I can say today that had it not been for Narsimha Rao, we would never have the economic reform. The media gave the credit to Manmohan Singh. If Manmohan Singh was such a revolutionary, then how come as Prime Minister he can't bring any reform at all? The ch I was a witness to the fact that every time Manmohan Singh became afraid that a certain reform would create problems, Narsimha Rao told him in my presence, Go ahead, I will take the blame. You don't have to worry. Unfortunately, Narsimha Rao has been slandered, has been abused, and his memory has been forcibly forgotten. 
but a future government should give him Bharat Ratna for bringing economic reforms to our country. Now, what happens is that once money is created, it is used for bribery, it is used for financing illegal and prohibited activities such as drugs, even assassination. It's all done by cash, large amounts of cash. So therefore, black money is created because people find it not, they do not find it in their interest to pay the legitimate amount. So in the long run when I talk about solution, we must have laws where there is an incentive to pay taxes. And there is also an understanding that nothing will happen even if we break the law. A contempt for law develops in the society and then people start putting away money without fear. That was the problem with 2G also. <coughs> Raja thought that if he gives everybody a little money and he'll give little, he only kept he only per chap kept about 5% of the money, which is of 60,000, 5% is only 3,000 crores. <laughs> Considering he used to travel in a cycle 15 years ago, that's a long way to come. But he distributed to others, thinking they will protect him. But they are not protected. But the general atmosphere was that nothing will happen. Even ordinary people were saying nothing is going to happen. I wrote a letter to the Prime Minister that this big scandal has taken place. Please give me permission to prosecute Raja. Silence. I sent him another letter. I sent him five letters. Now Manmohan Singh is my friend of 40 years. When I used to see him in the Central Hall of Parliament, I used to ask him what happened to my letters. He says, you know what the problem is. You want sanction, but I have to take sanction from somewhere else first. <laughs> he didn't say that, but that was what he meant. <laughs> so, therefore, he didn't get. I went to court, to the Supreme Court and said, the government is not prosecuting Raja and not letting me also prosecute Raja. Under the Prevention of Corruption Act, every citizen has the right to initiate the case. And even more, the court can appoint him as public prosecutor. Normally under criminal law, only a government appointed lawyer who is enrolled in the bar, which I am not, enrolled in the bar can become a public prosecutor. But in the public in the Prevention of Corruption Act, there is a section 5 which says the complainant can be appointed as public prosecutor by the court. So when I first told the court this, they said, how is that possible? You are not a lawyer, you are not an enrolled lawyer, you are not a government appointed lawyer, how I can appoint you public prosecutor? So I said, read section 5, and he said, you read it out. I read it out. He said, I didn't know this. <laughs> so there are many laws in our country which if you read and implement, you can bring to book crooked people even today. But you need judges with some fearlessness. And that happened when Justice Kapadia became Chief Justice of India. <laughs> he made the password to everybody, all the judges, that on corruption, don't hesitate. And two of the finest judges formed a bench, Justice Singhvi and Justice Ganguly, and I went before them. The court asked the government, what the Prime Minister is doing, not replying to the letters? And it turned out, 
that when the Prime Minister was asked to file an affidavit by the court, this is the first time in the history of the world that a Prime Minister has been asked to file a, a, an affidavit of court. Prime Minister being asked to file an affidavit in court means the court doesn't believe it. So that's why they want them to swear an affidavit. And so the entire records came. And what did it show? My letter goes to PM. PM writes on it very important, serious allegations. Kindly advice. It goes to the secretary, goes to the law ministry, law ministry says nothing in it. And then it comes back and the secretary also says nothing in it and the thing is filed. Because Manmohan Singh knows only economics, but he doesn't know any law, so he kept quiet. That is why when everybody was asking for his resignation, he said scandalous, even in court people were saying that now he must resign. I said no, he mustn't resign. People could understand why I am protecting him. I am protecting him because if he goes, who will come? <laughs> will he be any better than this man? At least with this man I can say that he is, doesn't take any decisions, but he doesn't take money also. <laughs> you will get in his place somebody who takes decisions and takes money also. <laughs> that will be worse. And one more thing, there is nothing surprising. I have known him as a professor, we were professors together. Known him for 40 years. We used to say in those days that he is a biological wonder because he is born without a spine. <laughs> Only human being born without a spine. So therefore, the process started. And slowly the court decided that CBI has been sleeping, everybody has been sleeping, so the first time the court decided that they will monitor the investigation. The CBI cannot listen to the government, CBI cannot listen to the ministers, CBI can, will only listen to the court and they will come and periodically place the status report, court will study it, ask myself and the other uh, people who are in the case what their opinion is and then the court will give some direction. This is what has changed everything. And as long as this procedure is there, I can tell you nobody in 2G is going to escape. In the next charge sheet, another Tamilian minister is going to go to jail. <laughs> Diane D. Maharaj. After that, one more Tamilian minister will go. P. Chidambara. <laughs> He will go in August. <laughs> Maran will go in July. <laughs> One Tamilian a month only. <laughs> but it is not a pure DMK show anymore. It is both of them together. Congress and DMK are together in this. There will be many more ministers coming. But the fact is, it is shocking. What happened with this money? Raja personally arranged to see through Sadiq Basha and in a place called Tirukarai. He arranged through the Havala for all this money to go abroad. 46 billion dollars, which is 45 percent of I mean, it is, it is four, four and a half percent or a little more than four, five percent of the GDP. In one flow, and as Dr. Krishna Swami pointed out, ten percent of all the flows since 1947. Today, there are one and a half trillion dollars are deposited, and now we have added another ten percent to it. Such a lot of money, if that money was available today, to the government, then we will make a big difference. So how does the money travel abroad? Through Havala. If you do a deal with a foreign company, there is no need for Havala. They will deposit it in foreign currency abroad. We are buying aeroplanes today, jet fighters. 
What, how was the money being deposited, be deposited? The French want it. And the French get it, they will put the money directly in Switzerland. What happened in Bofors? They put it directly in Switzerland. There was no need for Havana. So Havana is only one route. The other route is, if you interact with foreigners, then it then they will ensure to deposit it directly. Have an illegal bank account. Now the new method is illegal bank account not in your name, in the name of somebody else. From the telephone directory you pick a name. Just now you see Germany, the intelligence bureau went and bribed a senior official of the Liechtenstein Bank. This is China, a small country and it is also a haven for illegal money. In fact, have more secrecy than even Switzerland. So Germany had come to know that some of their top politicians are putting money in Liechtenstein, which is on the border with Austria and, and Germany. And so they, their intelligence outfit went and bribed a senior officer of Liechtenstein and said, give us all the illegal accounts because illegal accounts are numbered accounts. So that person put the entire thing in a CD and gave it to the German government. How much did he get for it? Forty million dollars. Now, then Germany selected, uh, downloaded that CD and divided up the divided up the uh, names according to nationality. They got 21 countries' names. One of them was India. It had 16 names in it. And they wrote the letter to all the governments. I we have got the names of your nationals having secret bank accounts and the amounts and the records, we are ready to send it to you if you want it. Twenty countries immediately wrote saying we want it. But India did not write. Because we were short of ink for something. <laughs> I wrote a letter to the PM. There he replied, don't worry, I will do something. It is nothing. Finally, the Supreme Court came into the picture. How? Because there was one scrap collector from Hyderabad living in Pune called Hassan Ali. So one junior income tax officer said, this man is a scrap collector. But he's got horses. He's got a huge mansion. So we need to find out. So they raided his place. So they raided his place and they found lots of documents of Swiss bank accounts. So they put her, they added it up, it turned to be eight billion dollars. Eight billion dollars means forty thousand crores. Forty thousand crore rupees. In his account, scrap dealer. Now, once they did it, they interviewed him, and they interrogated him. In the CD, in the recording, tape recording, he says, Don't touch me. I have got important people who are my friends. Sonia Gandhi, uh, Ahmad Patel, X, Y, Z. He started naming them. So these income tax people, they got very really frightened. They wrote to the finance ministry. Who is the finance minister? Chidambaram. <laughs> now, what Chidambaram did is another matter. It's going to be another case, so I won't mention to you just now. But Chidambaram then wrote a letter to Switzerland saying, please confirm that this account number, numbered account number, has $8 billion. Switzerland wrote back. Yes, we confirm. 
then Chidam Ramesh transferred to Home Ministry and Pradam Mukherjee comes and he writes to the Switzerland government, my predecessor wrote you a letter but he gave the wrong uh, password and therefore this is the correct password for which we want to know whether there are any accounts. So Chitaman wrote, uh, wrote back, no, no, there is no such account by this password and this numbers. So they defrost the account of Hassan Ali. Within 24 hours, all the 8 million dollars have disappeared. Now people say, how is it possible Hassan Ali is in Pune? How he, with all the people watching him, how he can clear? So now we got a new operation, a modest operandi. In Hassan Ali's name, the account is open, but the password is with somebody in Delhi, very important person in Delhi. So that person can operate the account, but Hassan Ali cannot operate the account. <laughs> Similarly, now this Dishinstein Bank, 16 names, one name is Chetan Gandhi. That we were, the, the newspaper, the TV people went to him and he was living in an ordinary flat and earning 8,000 rupees a month. He said, how do I can go to listing side? I don't even know where it is. Whether it is in near Haryana or it is somewhere else. <laughs> so what happened? His name is there. Another name is Hasmuk Gandhi. Lots of Gandhi names. <laughs> I wonder who, which Gandhi they mean anyway. And all these names are taken from a telephone directory and the password is yours. Because now we have internet banking, all you need is password. Name doesn't matter. You can always forge passports, uh, passport records and so on. So this is why it has now become so difficult. Because of these things that are happening. Or the money will be taken out of one account, put into another account, from another account and go to another account. And finally they will reach the final destination. So you have to trace it all through. It requires a lot of work. And our uh, enforcement directorate is not good for it. Take for example what happened in, uh, in this uh, Kaleja TV. First it goes from DB reality to Kusegaon, fruit, fruit and vegetable. From fruit and vegetable it goes to something else. And finally it turns up in Kaleja TV. And they now say that was an unsecured loan. How many, how many crores? 214 crores. How much is your company worth? 5 crores. Now why would anyone give unsecured loans of 214 crores to a company which has only 5 crores to pay up capital? But the truth is that when the money came, they distributed. It was not a, uh, a unsecured loan at all. It was, it was made a flat payment in the name of buying some shares and that money was distributed amongst the family. On 24th December 2010, Raja gets the summons from the CBI. So then they get scared. They put it all together, all the money back, put in an account and give it back. This unsecured loan with 8% with interest. I said, what did I loan? But we have returned it back. Unfortunately, the records do not support that. That is why Kandimuri is in jail. And she's going to be in jail for a long time. <laughs> and uh, of course, now we have Tamil Nadu police and, uh, and they give masadas also in TR jail, so it's not so bad. <laughs> so, like this, this layering, so this money is transferred, either put in the account, and then after that it is put to another account, then into another account, then into another. So you need a huge staff to follow it around. There is a shortcut, I will tell you that in the end, when I say how to do it. Now, 
there was one problem which Chidambaram has solved for all illegal bank holders. You see, earlier on, you put your money in, say, Switzerland Bank. For each numbered account, Switzerland does not give interest on the deposit. It charges a service charge. So not only you put your money, but every year a deduction is made as service charge. So naturally these people felt, what is this? We put all this money in Switzerland and they take service charge on top of that. There must be a way to earn money on this. So a new financial derivative was created. It is called participatory note. Participatory note will not come in the newspapers at all. No one wants to publish anything about it. Here and there, Business Line may have an article. But uh, all, there's a book by Mr. Vekates where he deals with this in great detail. So, like that will happen, but not general. What is this participatory note? By the way, there is no country in the world there is participatory note. Only in India, the brainchild of Mr. Chidambaram. <laughs> and Tarapura committee said, what is this you are doing? Remove, scrap participatory note. Ignored. Damodaran, the uh, SAP chairman, he said, this is all wrong. That Mr. Chidambaram they exempted participatory note from oversight by SEBI. SEBI looks at all stock market transactions, all financial transactions which involve buying and selling of shares. But for participatory note, exempted. So he protested. And what happened to Damodaran? He is now retired and living quite peacefully. Sent home. No further extension. This participatory note is obtained in the following way. I have an account in foreign country, either deposited by foreigners or through Havala. Then I take, withdraw that, put it in a sack, of, in a sack and go to Morgan Stanley or to uh, Fidelity Investors. Fidelity Investments is an American company, Morgan Stanley is also, but it has an office in London. So, uh, therefore, this participatory note is issued to you the moment you put the bag of cash and it will just be a plain piece of paper in which the amount will be written. You take that piece of paper, come back to India and go to the stock market and you can buy shares. Once the, once the shares are bought, the stock market will rise, then you sell and then go back to the Reserve Bank and collect the, back the money and because you know, your participatory note, the full refund is paid. No SEBI in the picture. And then you get to go away. For whatever tax is tax. For that you come via Mauritius. One rupee, one dollar company can be created in, in Mauritius. Paid up capital of one dollar. Come with that, through that by the shares, the stock market will, uh, will uh, rise, sell it and take it away. 61 billion dollars came in just two months and the stock market now can, is completely rigged because of participatory notes. It can go up and come down in any number of times. So you are earning also on your money. So the question now becomes, how do you bring the money back? <laughs> These are the techniques by which it is profitable now to have money abroad. You earn on it. Of course, once you earn on it, you can do a thousand things. You can 
by power trading in commodities inflation and then sell it when the prices have risen. You can uh, uh, buy real estate, property values will go up. Today it's very difficult to get an apartment cheaply because of all this money. You can put it in elections. So you can do all these things. So the question now becomes if the economy is going to be disrupted this way. It's not a question of countries' money going abroad only, but what this money does when it comes back. And it, it spoils your stock market, it spoils your property market, it spoils your investment priorities, it creates inflation, multi effect. Now, one of the methods thought was amnesty. Say, all right, please all bring your money back and you have to pay a small tax and then it will become white money. That is a pure racket. You should never go for it. You have promised secrecy, but it turns out that many ministers have brought their money back this way. The other way is crack down. Crack down on the Havana operators. That, again, is only partial problem. What about the money foreigners deposit? For instance, in this 2G, the license was sold to Eti Salat by Swan Telecom, which got the license. And Unitech, which got the license, sold it to Telenor. Home Ministry says no financial transaction should take place with Eti Salat. Or with Telenor, the Home Ministry document I have included in my book. Why? Because Eti Salat is a proxy for ISI of Pakistan. And the managing director, Shahid Balwaz, is an associate of Daoud Ibrahim. And Swan Telecom, after getting the license at one tenth the market price, has sold it to Eti Salat. They bought it at eight times the price which was paid by Swan to the government of India. Naturally, the CAG made an estimate that had we used market price, how much would we have got? We would have got 176,000 crores more than what we got. How much did we get? 14,000 crores only. What did we give up? 176,000 crores. So, therefore, you tracking down on Havala operators is only part of the problem. There is one method by which you can find out all these multi-layer companies. And that is if the United States is willing to help you. Because the United States, in a place called Fort Meade, near Washington, has a very powerful electronic center. And any transaction of any account by internet goes into a computer in Fort Meade. Even if you are making a transaction, say your, you, your uh, son or daughter comes from America and then sends a through the internet sends a message that please transfer so much money into such and such account. Even that will be recorded by the US. And then US has certain words. And if those words are in any of the transactions, automatically it will give you a download. It will say Dawdi Brand. So all transactions connected with Dawdi Brand will be downloaded. We do not have an understanding in the United States on that. Because, how can you have? You cannot have because the people who have to do it are the ones who have the bank account in the first place. And you can't expect them to commit suicide. The another foolproof method, which Baba Ramdev said, of course I told him about it, 
declare her name by ordinance. All Indian bank accounts abroad in the following countries are hereby nationalized. If, however, any deposit holder, bank account holder, proves that this is a legitimate account, the account will be defrozen and handed back. This is the most effective way to bring the money back. All you have to do, now they accept this. And it is this one issue which they could not agree. Declare, and I have verified this by, from Switzerland. Declare that all Indian accounts are hereby nationalized and are property of the Indian government. But those who file an application saying that our account is legitimate and prove it, will return back the account. Those who cannot, too bad. Switzerland has a new law passed last October called Restitution of Illegal Properties Act of Politically Exposed Persons. <laughs> if you can say, I want the account of, for example, don't take it personally, of Sonia Gandhi. <laughs> She is a politically exposed person. Then I have to say in Switzerland, all the money that she has in Switzerland, please hand it over to us. This is what happened with Mubarak. This is what happened with Gaddafi. This is what had happened originally with Marcos. Just name all the Indian politicians. Take, to, to begin with, the names of all MPs of parliament. Send it there. These are politically exposed persons. And please give them, give us their bank accounts. There is a Prevention of Money Laundering Act in the country. And under the provisions of that act, you can attach the properties of all these people who have accounts abroad. Start attaching them. Maybe tomorrow Kalinda TV will become state-owned. Vanoli. Tamil Nadu. Arsham Dattoda. Vanoli or something. Whatever. What do you say? Do the same. Do the same. Do the same. So the law is there. Only think about our Bharat's uh, Lokpal bill that we need to adopt. Everything else is flat. Flat, you see, and, and, uh, and it's a flat. And that is that an independent public prosecutor institution should be adopted who will not be under the government. But the CBI and the, uh, and the other agencies, enforcement directed, will work under him. This Hong Kong did, and in, in a very short time, Hong Kong from the most corrupt Asian country became one of the cleanest Asian countries. So therefore, there are plenty of ways to bring the money back. Have an agreement with the Americans, but then only those people can sign that agreement who don't have an account in Switzerland and other places. <laughs> they can't expect people in government who have accounts. They are not able to give the 16 names to the Supreme Court. Liechtenstein, they say, no, we have a treaty agreement with Germany. Treaty agreement with Germany if the accounts were in Germany. Germany stole those accounts from Liechtenstein and has volunteered to give it to you. And you are not taking it. And you are giving all this cock and bull story that there is some agreement in there. Prada Mukherjee. What will I think about him? When he says like this, 
must mean that he is either protecting himself or somebody else. Above him. So, therefore, have an agreement with the Americans, saying that in the context of terrorist financing, because terrorists are using these methods. M.K. Narayanan says this, that participatory notes are being used by terrorists to earn money to kill you. So, you have to do this, number one. Number two, you nationalize all the accounts as demanded by Baba Ramdev. Three, you attach the properties of those who have been found prima facie and under the law of uh, Prevention of Money Laundering Act, you can do it even when it's prima facie. Attach their properties and seal their accounts within the country. And finally, you do some prosecution. Some people must be prosecuted. Today the atmosphere is nobody can be prosecuted. In January 2008, two press conferences were held almost simultaneously. One in New York and one in Hyderabad. Hyderabad Satya, Satyam Ramalinga Raju addressed the press conference saying, I have done fraud with my accounts and I am ready to face any punishment. Around the same time, Bernard, what is his name? Bernard the Madoff, that's right. Bernard Madoff addressed a press conference. I have cheated on pension funds and I am ready to suffer any punishment. Six months later, Bernard Madoff was in jail for 150 years imprisonment. Several charges, each of them consecutively to be carried out. All the sentences consecutively carried out added up to 150 years. And here in India, Satyam Ramalinga Raju in air conditioned hospital, nothing has happened. Charges have not been framed yet. That has to change. I am happy that today on the 2G, the court has said that the CBI court will meet every day. Because now they are on vacation till 6th of uh, July. But then, because of that, I am hoping that the first conviction will come some, sometime towards the end of this year and then the convictions will continue. I would like first of all Mr. Raja <laughs> to be prosecuted so that he has an incentive to talk. Mm. I have to tell you that North India originally thought that all Tamilians are crooks because every name that was coming was Tamilian. But the man who exposed Raja was himself a Tamilian by name Ashirvadam Achari. He was the private secretary of, uh, of, uh, of Raja and he came to my house one night and said, Hey, Tamamuri is that. I want to tell the whole thing. That's how I got into the whole thing. People say, how did you get all these documents? Well, I got it from Raja. Not directly, but indirectly. <laughs> so therefore, there are people like that. Now, what can you do? First of all, this depression must go, this pessimism must go, nothing will happen. Something has to happen. That attitude you have to have. <laughs> Second, we have to inculcate the value, which uh, Dr. Krishnasamy read out in my book, that money is not everything. Rich people are not necessarily happy. Some time ago, recently, now I mean, some time ago means only recently, some time ago, a very rich, well, I mean, Oscar winning Hollywood actress by name Julia Roberts came to Haryana for shooting. And she told her people in the 
uh, in, the, in the set. Then the Indian people, so poor and yet they seem to be happy. What is the secret? So they took her to a Swamiji. And the Swamiji gave her about Bhagavad Gita and all this, you see, how you have only power to act. The fruits are not in your hands. Therefore, whatever you get, don't think that this is your achievement. Like that, you know, he gave her philosophy. She was so impressed. And she went back and she and her entire family became Hindu. <laughs> Recently, I heard that the iPhone owner, Stephen Jobs, has also become Hindu. Because in the United States, people with all their material progress are not happy. That is why whoever our sadhus go there, foreigners come in large numbers, even in India. Go to C.C. Ramishankar or when Puttipati Sai Baba was there, they were Swami Dayan and ashram. All these sadhus, you see, are flooded with foreigners from rich countries. Even when I go to teach at Harvard because my name is Swami, <laughs> people think that I should tell them how to be happy. <laughs> Maybe Krishna Swami also, you can come. <laughs> Why is that? Because this idea first struck me when I went as a student in long years ago to Harvard to get a PhD. And my American classmate asked me, how can you make Mahatma Gandhi your leader? I said, why? In America he cannot become leader. They said, in America we will send him to jail for indecent exposure. <laughs> then the thought occurred to me, millions following this man half closed, you see. Even Baba Ramdev with half closed. People are following him. In America, unless you are very well dressed, you get the best suit and best tie, you are not considered a leader. That shows the, a difference in our culture. Sanatana Dharma is the longest civilization in the world. All the other civilizations are broken up. Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Babylonian, all of them are broken up. But this is still continuing because from the very beginning, as Brigu, Rishi Brigu said, money is not the highest value. You can make money, nothing wrong with it. But it's not the highest value. Highest value is knowledge. And the person who has knowledge should not have any wealth, should not have any weapons, should not have any land. Unfortunately, this whole system got connected with birth. Otherwise, originally it was not like that. After all, the person who wrote Mahabharata was Veda Vyasa. His mother was a fisherwoman. He didn't come from a Brahmanical family. Similarly, Valmiki was supposed to come from a Dalit family. And he wrote the Ramayana. Then uh, Kalidasa was a hunter. Vishwam is a Rishi of Rishis, came from a Kshatriya family. Ravan was a Brahmin. <laughs> Took me a long time to convince Ra uh, Karnanidhi that Ravan was a Brahmin. <laughs> but he still got some wrong notions. He says, Rama is a Brahmin. Rama is not a Brahmin, he is a Kshatriya. One day got angry with uh, me because in uh, Supreme Court I said, Rama Setu. He said, how it is Rama Setu? Rama is now an engineer. Which engineering college he got a degree from? You will remember that. Next day he fell ill and he was admitted to Ram Chandra Medical Hospital. <laughs> so this is our culture that has to come. This globalization has made us materialistic oriented. One dimension, make money. Ask any youngster today which course he wants to take. That's where I get the biggest salary. MBA. Not what I want to do, but where I can earn the most. Once 
this business of acquiring wealth becomes the sole objective, I'm not saying it should not be an objective, but cannot be the sole objective. But once it becomes sole objective, then greed comes. And once greed comes, corruption is bound to come. In the short run, you can have laws to bring your money back, but it will go again. You need a new outlook in life. And that outlook is where money is not the highest rated value in society. And that is why sometimes people misunderstand when I say that corruption is our main disease today and Sanatana Dharma is our main cure today. You want to cure it, bring back those values. Foster it, cultivate it, make your children realize it. It doesn't mean that they should give up everything. But if somebody gives up, then like Mahatma Gandhi, he is venerated. The more you give up, the more you are venerated. But that means everybody has to do it. But at the same time, social prestige should not depend on money. If that happens, we have a long-term solution for corruption in the country. Thank you very much.